Um, 10 years uh, is, is a long time. 2013, that's when this, this started. And here's just some of the most popular things that were happening in 2013, okay? Uh, the Geico Camel yelled hump day. That was 2013. <laughs> this was the year of the selfie. 2013, that's how long ago. <laughs> Swag was a cool word. That was 2013. Swag was a cool word. Uh, Froyo was popping up everywhere, which I still don't know what Froyo was, but it was everywhere in 2013. Um, we had a president that was younger than 50. That was 2013. Um, kale was a superfood. It became out as a superfood. And I saw that someone made a kale dish, and I was like, this is apropos. I love it. This is fantastic. Um, we didn't know how to bake bread at home yet because there wasn't a pandemic. That was 2013. Uh, the Colorado River, uh, unfortunately, was named one of the most endangered rivers in North America. And I had just graduated high school in 2013, so 10 years has been a, 10 years has been a long time. Um, a lot has changed in 10 years, and a lot will change in the next 10 years. Uh, and I hope by, you know, the end of my the end of my speech, the end of our conversation, that. Uh, uh, we, I believe that through like mentorship and community that we can adapt and thrive and be able to stay together. Um, and I hope you leave this evening with hope uh, amongst each other and hope for the future, um, especially seeing all the, the young kids up here. Um, I think that was, that's very, very inspiring because um, a lot of places you don't, you don't see that. So my name is Elon Thomas Stribling. I'm, I'm a lot of things, but right now I'm an outdoor educator, an angler, and a, a, a stand-up comedian. Um, I am a Colorado kid. I was born and raised in Colorado. I don't call myself a Colorado native because uh, that's different, you know? I, uh, whenever I see someone with a Colorado native sticker and I drive up next to them, I'm like, you're not native. Um, <laughs> that's a different sort of thing, <laughs> you know? Um, but I was, I was a Colorado kid. I was, I was born in uh, Denver. I grew up uh, going snowboarding at Winter Park. I, uh, I drove a two-wheel drive Honda Civic every winter through the mountains and only got stuck once. So <laughs> I'm a true Colorado kid. Uh, uh, so my grandfather, like Tony had mentioned, was a, was a wildlife biologist in South Africa and in the U.S. And he saw the eland, and when I was born, he named me eland. Um, he was actually the first black biologist for the Division of Wildlife of Colorado. Um, which, if you don't know what the Division of Wildlife is, it used, to, it used to be the Division of Wildlife, now it's Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Um, and he did avian research, um, and he was sort of how I got invested and involved in nature and wildlife and animals and things. Uh, my very first memories growing up uh, is like we would just sit on my grandmother's couch and just watch uh, Animal Planet, Nat Geo, PBS documentaries about animals. Um, Steve Irwin, like we would watch the Crocodile Hunter, and then a lot of times after the Crocodile Hunter, we would actually go to our neighborhood park and pretend to be whatever animals that we just like learned about. Um, and those are like some of my first core memories of of being out in nature and and just being at a park and you know nature looks different to a lot of different people. So to me, that was like being in the wild. Um, and then my my very first memory, especially with dealing with water and and our interaction with it, is we had a really bad rainstorm. And um, this is something that we always used to do, but we had a really bad rainstorm and all the, the gutters were flooded and there was so much water flowing. And um, we went out during the rainstorm, my grandfather and I, and we got popsicle sticks and leaves and we would like race our popsicle sticks and leaves like through the gutters and see like which one would get there first or like, um, like play different games and stuff like that. And that was like probably one of my, every time I think about it, it just makes me happy. And now I think that was like my start to fascination with not only uh, water, but just how things work and how we interact um, with it. So uh, that was more than 10 years ago. It was a long time ago, uh, but I absolutely loved thinking about it. And then my elementary and middle school, uh, high school years were tough. Uh, my, my father passed away when I was a lot younger, so it was just my mom and I, uh, and my grandfather went off to work. So it was, I had a really tough time uh, in college, finding community, finding people to, to feel like I, I belonged with. Um, and just finding any sort of purpose. I played sports, but it didn't really do anything. I was getting into a lot of trouble when I was in school. I was a, I was a bit of an angsty kid, a bit of a fighter. And, and the only reason I share that is just, I, I always try to turn my mess into like a positive message of like, yeah, you, I, I see kids nowadays and I'm like, even if you are, you know, having a tough time, you could be a decent person <laughs> when you get older, you know, you can, you can be okay. So 
uh, the only time I really, really felt like myself and I felt okay and good was when my grandfather would come back from, from Florida and we would go like birding or fishing and I felt like I belonged, not just with him, but just like on the water in nature. It, it felt like okay, like it felt like everything was all right. So um, that really, I think that really saved me and that really pushed me to, to you know, be involved in nature and be involved with uh, education and teaching. Um, and I promise at some point there will, this will be funny. Right now I'm just giving <laughs> you. And then you guys are like, this isn't funny. <laughs> it's okay. After I, uh, after I graduated high school, um, I went to Colorado State University um, and I went as a pre-vet. I was like, I wanted to save all the animals. I wanted to save all the animals. And then I went to pre-vet classes and pre-vet club and I was like, I don't want to do this <laughs> anymore. <laughs> Uh, and it, it had nothing to do with the classes. I still want to save animals, but I didn't want to save people's cats and dogs and turtles and birds and stuff like that. I wanted to save like wild animals and their environments and, and where they live and stuff like that. Um, and, I, and I have a dog. People think like, oh, you must, like I love dogs. You know, I, I registered my dog to be a service dog this past year because you could just do it super easy. And um, I actually took a road trip down to Texas and the hillbilly, well, I can't say hillbilly, hillbilly's their word. Uh, the hill person at the hotel was like, was like, you guys, you can't have dogs here. And I was like, no, you know, he's my service dog. He's doing me a service. And this is no joke. The guy walks behind the counter, looks at my dog, and just goes, thank you for your service. I was like, that's not. I was like, now I see why everyone gets a service dog. You know, it's really, you get a lot of discounts. So I... I love, an I love animals, I love cats and dogs and stuff, but that's not what I wanted to protect. That's not like what my, what my focus was, what I really, what I really cared about. So um, after, my, after my freshman semester, after my freshman year, I, I was like, I, I don't really want to do this. I don't know what I want to do. I don't know how to describe it. Um, but I joined the Wildlife Club, the Wildlife Club at CSU, the Wildlife Society. And on our, at the first meeting of the Wildlife Society, they brought in a bald eagle or a golden eagle and a red-tailed hawk. Um, and I remember like sitting in class, just like star, like starstruck, like I had seen a celebrity, and I was like, "Oh, people actually do like this isn't just like a Steve Irwin thing. Like people actually get the opportunity, not only to to work with wildlife and to work with cool animals, but to like show it to people and and to like share the knowledge and and the passion and the and the love for it." So I immediately I immediately fell in love. Um, I immediately fell in love. I switched my major to fish and wildlife and conservation biology and. Uh, after switching, I noticed something in my classes that I hadn't really noticed before. Uh, but especially at CSU, though, the classes were predominantly white, like pretty white, like like this, like white, you know. Um, you can say it like this room. Yeah, it's, and it's not a bad. I'm not shaming. I'm not upset. I'm not shaming anyone. I'm just saying what the fact was. It's just white. It was like white, like windy white, like white, like really. And uh, a lot of people were like, oh, that's a bad thing. And I'm like, no, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just how the classes was. But as I was sort of going through my degree and, and learning and, and getting older and um, being comfortable in, in who I am and where I come from, I, I was like, I, want, I, I not only want to teach people, but I also want to give people the other opportunity to, to, to share this experience, right? Because the only person I knew who was a nature nerd was my grandfather. None of my friends, none of the people I grew up with cared about anything about the environment, they didn't care about anything in nature, they just knew like basic stuff, which is fine, but I, I, I had this sense and urgency of like, oh, I wanna share this with people who look like me. I wanna give people the opportunity to like go outside and whether that's ski or snowboard, then that's how you get involved with nature, whether that's going fishing, backpacking, birding, whatever that looks like, I wanted people to do that. So as I was going through my degree, this was like always playing in the back of my head and I, I promised my degree, I promised myself that after I get like the academic knowledge and love that I would, you know, get a chance to show people um, while I was a nerd chasing bugs in the creek. Uh, and my grandfather always used to say this thing, and I never really understood it until I got to college, but he used to say, you can't be what you can't see. And I, that never, never really made sense to me until I got to college and I was like, oh, you, you know, growing up I only saw people who did like certain jobs or had certain career paths. But then as I got older, I was like, oh, you can't be what you can't, like that makes sense. You can't a attain to something or you can't want to do something unless you see other people who maybe look like you, who be like, oh, I can do that. I have the opportunity to do that, to connect with those things like that. So that really resonated with me. And then 
kind of towards my end of my uh, second semester of my sophomore year, I, I just uh, started fly fishing. Um, I was I was madly in love with the young lady my sophomore year, and she was like, "Hey, we should we should try something new," and I got excited. And um, she took me to a fly tying class, and I was like, "This isn't what I thought it was going to be." And we went to the fly tying class. It was like a four week class to get extra credit, and we went to the fly tying class and we learned how to tie flies and i immediately was like so enthralled with the idea of like taking all these materials and making something special and then using this specific thing to go catch fish and what did it look like um and then we spent like the next month chasing carp around fort collins and it was like it was like a dream come true like i don't everything just sort of pieced together of my life it felt like everything happened right in that moment um and so the you know the fly fishing stuck around she didn't but um <laughs> I was happy with that decision, you know, uh, and so it was. It was. It was great. It was. It was fantastic. Um, and then while I was at CSU, um, after I started fly fishing, I actually helped start the CSU Fly Fishing Club. Um, and our, our big our big goal was not only uh, to have like share a space with other fly fishing nerds and outdoor fishing nerds, but it was to um, bring in more people into fly fishing. So that was like a big part of what my purpose was in the club or like what my thing was in the in the program was just to invite more people and more community in the fly fishing to say like hey i'm new at this also but you can also join this and be a part of like a community uh, a, a culture an idea something that and we work to protect so part of our pillars were community um, conservation um, and then just fishing nerds people so that's all we did we focused on like can we invite people out to have fun with us to fish can we teach them can we protect something while we're also enjoying it? And then can we just like have a good time? You know, fly fishing is pretty snobby. So we tried to make sure it wasn't <laughs> snobby. We tried to make sure it was pretty cool and relaxed and so people felt um, comfortable. But while we were doing that, I kind of got involved with helping out with the GoPro games that happened in Vail. I kind of helped out with uh, TU stuff that happened in Colorado and around Denver. Um, and I fell in love with this idea of like, seeing kids get excited about fishing or helping a kid catch like a little styrofoam fish that was on the ground or anything like that and it like something about it just like like burned in my soul like every day i was like i wonder what we can do to like make fun stuff so we eventually we started putting uh mouse traps on like fake fish and then we would set up the mouse traps and then have the kids like cast to the fish and when they hit the fish it would like make a loud snap and everyone would cheer and the kids were just like absolutely excited uh and then we would have like a little kiddie pool and have like a bunch of like styrofoam, not styrofoam, but like glass fish in there. And they could go like pick them up, look at them and then put them back in to teach them like safe fish handling practices. Um, and it was just stuff like this. So I was just like, this is this is like what's fun. Like I've, I've caught a lot of fish, I've been to a lot of places, but like this was the most fun that I had. Fishing was just like teaching kids and teaching other people how to fish. So um, I graduated in 2018, barely, uh, <laughs> with a, uh, with my degree in conservation and, and wildlife biology. Um, and so for a couple years, I worked for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. I worked as a nuisance wildlife technician, a regular wildlife technician, an aquatic biology or aquatic technician. And then I also worked as a, uh, in the education department. So I kind of took everything that I learned and my experiences in college and sort of jammed them into four years of working with the state and figuring out how to navigate stuff, how to talk about funding, how to, um, how to really work through like the logistics of doing stuff. Um, and I absolutely loved it. I used to work with uh, bears, I actually relocated bears. That was like my my first job and it was like a dream come true. Cause I, you know, as a kid, I used to like see bears on TV and be like, oh man, that's so cool. And you see, learn all these bear facts. And then I got to like help relocate and measure bears and, and uh, do like population management on them. So it was like really, it was like really, really fun uh, to be a part of that. And one time, I can't tell the story now, but one time we had a bear break into a dispensary <laughs> and I was probably like my most fun day at work <laughs> it, was, it was fun for all of us but uh, <laughs> and so I got a lot of unique opportunities I got to meet a lot of really uh, fantastic people that they helped me but it, I was still sort of as I was in this nature space and in this wild space I just kept feeling more and more compelled and involved to to work with kids and work with community and work with people just to say, hey, come outside of me and like, let's enjoy it, let's have fun. Um, now, currently, I, I work for a couple of nonprofits in uh, Colorado and Denver. I work with uh, Lincoln Hill Cares, Conwood Institute, 
Um, and I work with middle schoolers pretty much. I work with middle schoolers across the state. Um, and I am an outdoor educator, so I teach kids about nature and animals and wildlife and stuff. I, my students nicknamed me the Black Steve Irwin a couple years ago. And that was like the proudest moment <laughs> of my life. So I like made it my Instagram name and like some of my students call me Mr. Irwin <laughs> and it like makes me proud. Uh, but yeah, I, so I teach middle schoolers around, around the, the state of Colorado and I, I love my middle schoolers. I, I love my students. Um, we teach them about wildlife management, ecosystem services. Um, we do a lot of service projects in one of my schools. Uh, my students, they, they didn't have a, a, a recycling program um, in Aurora, so they actually, part of their like project for the year was to get trash cans and recycling cans and then have the city come and like take recycling from the school. So that was like their project. Like that's what they focused on. They figured out all the details. They got to school, they got the city to help out. And that wasn't me, that was just me saying like, hey, here's how we can protect the planet. And they're like, oh, we have an idea. We don't have recycling in the school. So it's just little stuff like that where I'm like, to us, it's like recycling. To me, is recycling is just normal. But to them, they're like, we don't have this. I think we should help this out. And they're, you know, they're 12, 11, 10 years old. Um, so stuff like that makes me makes me really proud. Uh, and then it was, it was when I started working with kids that I felt at home. Uh, I've always felt at home, like in the river and nature. But it was really when I was like being around kids and like getting them excited about nature that I felt at home. Uh, and then I heard one time someone say, home is where you learn how to love. Um, and watching like kids grow up with you over the year, over the couple of years, uh, and like growing to people or becoming people and understanding stuff about the real world and themselves is like really beautiful. And I, I genuinely do, I, I love my students. I don't like all of them, but I love, <laughs> I, I love every single one of them. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's important, I, I work mostly with um, a, a students in foster care, uh, black and Hispanic kids. Um, and I, I genuinely believe that the world distributes talent equally. I believe that, I believe every, however you get it, the world distributes talent equally, but it doesn't distribute opportunity equally. So it doesn't matter if the same two kids have the same amount of talent. If one kid just has a couple more doors open, then that kid's just gonna run through those doors, right? Now the kid who's gonna have to fight through those doors. So all I do is, um, especially with my kids, all I do is I just, I try to create a space where they feel safe enough to explore and ask questions. So that's all I do, create a space where they feel safe enough to explore and ask questions so they have the opportunity to fail at some stuff, succeed at other stuff, and just be excited and just have the opportunity to do that so they know that one day I wanna be a biologist, one day I wanna be a fly fishing guide, one day I wanna do this, I wanna do that. So um, I, I really do work, I love working with kids and if no one paid me, which I barely get paid anyway, uh, <laughs> I would still do it, you know, I, I would still do it. And I have students um, who were born and raised in Denver, like in Denver, Colorado, who look at the mountains and say, oh, I didn't know that place was like close to home. Like we've taken students backpacking, and we've taken to the strip, we've, ta we've taken students two trips in the mountains, where we've gotten to the mountains and they say like, is this in like Colorado? And we're like, yeah, we're like two hours away from Denver, like this is, and they're like, wow, I never knew this existed. But they've grown up their entire life looking at the mountains. So even, even stuff like that, where earlier I was talking about what, uh, what nature could look like for you. So nature for us, I mean, you guys have the most beautiful backyard in the world, but nature to other people is just like going to the park with their grandfather, or maybe it's going to the city park and walking their dog. Like the, the, the level of, of nature changes with people, but I think as long as we can still connect it, whether it's the park or whether it's the beautiful mountains, I think it's, it's all the same. So um, one time I do have to share a story. One time we planned a, a, a three day overnight trip um, with a bunch of sixth and seventh graders, um, but most of them are scared because they had never been backpacking, they had never been that far away from home. Um, um, but we practiced like setting up tents, we practiced how we would store food, we practiced how we would wash our hands, <clears throat> we practiced like how we would do cook and clean up at the end of the night. Um, and so we finally make it up to the campsite, we drive up to the campsite, and we have to walk a little bit up the ways to our campsite. And so as a, as a group activity, get everyone circled and settled, um, I asked what I asked all my students. I said, uh, I said, hey, what did everyone bring for a snack, right? So I said, what did everyone bring for a snack? And we all go around the circle. And one of my students who I love, uh, but I just don't like him that much, <laughs> uh, he, he thinks he's a funny, he's like the class clown, he's like the class clown, which is what I was, so I, I understand him. 
Um, but he like holds up this thing wrapped in plastic and he goes, mister. And I was like, what's up X? And he's like, I have a kilo of granola. And I was like, I don't think you're allowed to have that much <laughs> granola. And he was like trying to be funny. And I was like, what flavor? And he was like cinnamon. And I was like, okay, that's good. That's good, man. Um, and then he was like sharing it with other kids. And I was like, you can't, you can't pretend to do that. <laughs> and I know we're in nature, but we're still in school. Like you can't pretend to be like giving other kids granola, uh, cinnamon granola, but um, yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I do love I do love uh, working with them because they are they are um, very funny. You know, they all have they all have stories. They all have their own groups in school um, and the way they, they they feel about each other. I uh, I did have a kid. I like to teach my kids uh, Latin names and stuff because I want them to like have that sort of uh, adventure or even have that base knowledge even as middle schoolers. Um, and one of my favorite uh, Latin names is Shepardia canadensis. It's the Canadian buffalo berry, Shepardia canadensis. Um, and I just like the way that sounds. So I like teaching my students, like, hey, if you see this bush, what's it called? Shepardia canadensis. And I always, I'm always telling them, like, hey, try to remember that, right? Like, try to remember a way to, like, stick that in your brain forever. And so we got back from a trip one time, and I asked all my students, I was like, all right, whoever answers this gets a piece of candy, right? And I was like, does anyone name the Latin name of the Canadian buffalo berry? And one of my kids in the back just goes, she purdy, huh? <laughs> and I didn't want to punish him because he was right. <laughs> but the way he said it was a little creepy. <laughs> like I, I was like, what is it? He's like, she purdy, huh? And I was like, what's the other part? He's like, canadensis. And I was like, all right, you get it, you know? So, so they're fun. They could be, they could be wild, but they're, they're all uh, extraordinary kids. Um, and I'm very, very blessed and lucky to, to be able to teach them. Uh, just going to the rest of my notes. Um, I've learned just as much as my students um, from, from being with them. Uh, I, I, they've taught me more than I would have thought I've ever learned. Uh, one time we were hiking up to the Netherlands. We were going to this uh, lake, and it was like a four-mile hike, uh, which was pretty easy for the kids. And um, like we all have in our jobs, in our companies, in our lives, we have leaders and we have different roles. So I assigned one of my students with a lot of energy, I assigned him to be a leader. I was like, you go lead the group at, when we get out there. That way you're, you know, you're out of the way, you're sort of walking, you're setting the pace, right? And it's like halfway through the hike and I noticed that he's in the back. And I was like, well, what's he doing in the back? So I'm already in my head, I'm like, well, I'm gonna have to tell him to get to the front. Like this isn't, I'm gonna have to like, discipline them or we're gonna go into like a little back and forth but I get back there and I was like hey is everything okay and he's like yeah I'm good and I was like well, well what are you doing in the back and he's like well I, I wanted to be up front but I can't encourage people from the front like if I'm in the front I can't help people so I decided to come to the back and like tell people like we're gonna keep going we're gonna make it we're gonna be okay and I was like well I'm the worst <laughs> you know like I was like I'm a terrible person because in my mind being a being a leader it's just like being up front and just charging away and saying like, hey, this is how we're gonna do it. This is gonna set the pace. But in his mind, being a leader meant like, hey, being in the back and encouraging and pushing. And it really like, that, that moment like really, really stuck with me, not only in my like, in that school day, but in like my professional life and my like, my, my, uh, my group life. Cause now I just come back and I'm just like, yeah, you can like be in the back and encourage people. You don't always have to lead. Um, from the front, and so I even think about that uh, now, and especially in like conservation stuff or or um, in, in group settings. You know, I'm always thinking like, well, I guess you know, if if you are if you are a leader in the in the organization like UWP, um, and maybe you don't have the answers to a project, or maybe you're like, hey, I don't know what project we're gonna do. I don't know what this next year is gonna look like. I don't know how we're gonna have a fundraising thing, and then you can just without, you can lead from the, you can help out from the back. You can encourage and say, hey, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. I'm just here to support however you can. So um, I really appreciate Xavier for, for uh, sharing that knowledge with me. Um, Cause I like to think of it as like inspiration through results. Like we're gonna see um, inspirations through the actions that uh, we take at the end of the day. So um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, my kids are mean. I just wanted to share this uh, before I get out of here. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm pretty old, kind of a little bit, and uh, 
when I was when I was my kid's age, I used to look at people my age and be like, "What? That's old. Like you, they are old people." You know, like I used to look at kids, my adults who were leading my camps or leading my classes, and be like, "Wow, they must have been alive for a really, really long time." Um, and now my students look at me that way, and it hurts my feelings. <laughs> and even one of my students, they were they were like, "Mister, you you try to dress like one of us sometimes." And that, that hurt my feelings a lot, because I was like, I just try to dress like a normal person. <laughs> and, but they're middle schoolers, so I, I love, there's, there's great days and there's bad days, but um, I, I really do like, uh, I like hanging out with them. Um, I, and I think that if, if we're gonna be successful uh, in community and leadership and conservation, um, I just think that uh, it's about the next, uh, and I've said this before, but. I always say, like, if we're going to be successful with the next generation, it's not about the next election; it's about the next generation. Because it, we could, all the people that we're voting for now or that we're looking up to now, they also are old and they're stuck in their ways. But I think the next generation, even the the young people who are here this evening, they have the hope, they have the answers, they have new ideas um, that we are maybe too stubborn to think of or come up with, um, and so. I always say it's not about the next election, it's about the next generation. Um, and then lastly, before I get out of here, the, I love talking about um, community, because I feel a sense of that tonight, I feel a sense of that when I'm in this town, I feel a sense of that whenever I get around anglers or even other comedians, it's, I like feeling like a part of something. I think we all do, I think we all like feeling a part of something, even if it's, if it's minuscule. And um, I always like sharing this anecdote that like, if you, if you were born and raised uh, in a mountain town in Colorado and you went to Denver and you saw someone else with the, with the t-shirt that said, tell you right, you would go up to him and be like, hey, that's so cool, do you live in Tell I live in New Right. And that's, at that moment you're like, oh, we're part of the same community, right? And then let's say if you go to New York and you're standing in line at a restaurant in New York and you see someone with a sweatshirt that says like Broncos or says Colorado on it, you're gonna look at them and you're gonna go, Hey, are, do you live in Colorado? I live in Colorado, that's so cool. We're part of the same community, right? If you go to Italy and you're walking around Italy and you see someone and you hear an accent and someone goes, hey, where are you from? You're like, oh, I'm from Colorado. And they go, oh, I'm from New York. You're like, oh, we understand each other. We're both American, we're part of the same community. So I think this idea of community is always shifting and it's not like a concrete thing, right? So we can all be in here and look at each other and say, hey, we're all part of the same community. But if we leave here, we have different lives and different aspects and different people that we feel involved in. So I think when I, when I try to talk about conservation and education and, and reaching out to new people, I always try to make sure I emphasize that your community is just how you view it, right? So if you just view it and say like, we're us and them, they're them, that's not gonna solve a lot of problems, right? I think by opening up your community and say like, hey, this person lives in my town, they are part of my community. This person is downstream from where I'm at, they are part of my community. This person may have never touched foot in the mountains, but uh, when it comes time to vote, they are also gonna be able to vote, so they are part of my community. So I think uh, shifting the baseline of community, that's something that's flexible and reasonable and that's uh, encompassing and welcoming to other people only serves as a, as a benefit um, to whether that's, like I said, voting, whether that's protecting anything, whether that's just making sure like other people feel invited not only welcome to the table, but feel like they're an active participant. So, um, uh, lastly, I just want to say um, thank you all so much for uh, for having me. I know uh, it, I, it seems like it's been a great ten years, and can't wait for another ten years of this organization. Hopefully, um, someone cooler can come up and talk <laughs> next time. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I I think moving forward with I know you guys have the project of the uh, abandoned mine restoration site um, and just uh, river surveys and things like that. I, I hope that you can invite some new community members that you can think of to come only, not only you know help and be a part of it, but uh, maybe help steer the conversation or maybe help come up with new ideas. Um, as well as you know, you don't always have to be in the front to lead. Sometimes it it helps to have someone behind you just going, "Hey, we're doing the right thing. We're heading in the right direction." So. Uh, my name is Begilin Stribben. I appreciate you all so much. You guys have a fantastic night. Thank you.